Joining us here in our studio in Washington, D.C. is Jonathan Allen. He is the co-author of Shattered Inside Hillary Clinton's Doomed Campaign. Also joining us in New York, Amy Parnes, who is also a co-author of the book. To both of you, thanks for joining us this morning. Thanks for having us, Pedro. Thanks for having us, Pedro. Uh, Jonathan, we'll start with you. This book came out previously. You have new information in it. Particularly, where does that new information start when it comes to Hillary Clinton's campaign? Well, uh, so first of all, we've got some new information that dates back around uh, Labor Day before the end of the campaign. Some of the uh, some of the warning signs she was getting, some of the Democratic operatives who uh, felt like there wasn't enough going on in the ground in the states, some of the Democratic operatives who felt like there wasn't uh, a good enough message from Hillary Clinton about her economic plans and particularly uh, how they would help people uh, raise themselves up, um, how they would allow people to have a, a more aspirational uh, view of their own economics. Uh, so it starts back there, but we actually run past, well past uh, the election and some of the new material is about uh, the fight for the Democratic Party between uh, the Sanders factions and the Clinton factions. And there's a, uh, a really sort of intense scene in there uh, with Bill Clinton talking to Tom Perez and giving him instructions about what he wants him to do with the DNC, uh, which hasn't entirely worked out. Uh, Amy Parnes, just to revisit a little history then, if there were those concerns within the campaign about how it was going, what was then res the response from Hillary Clinton's team? I think uh, Hillary Clinton's team at the time kind of took it for granted and essentially thought that they were winning. Um, even on the days where uh, they, the not so good days, I think they still thought they were winning. Um, but I think if particularly going into the final stretch of the campaign um, in the final days of November, there was great optimism there that she would be elected president of the United States. And so within the team itself, were there those that say maybe we should readjust the message or at least readjust the strategy to compensate for that? And if that was the case, how were they received? I don't think that there was ever a time um, toward the end of the campaign in particular where they thought that they needed to adjust the message. I think at one point in time they, they felt like they wanted to end on a positive note and they kind of tweaked it a little to kind of hit Trump a little harder. But I, I don't think, I think that they, they felt like they had this and that, uh, you know, that they were feeling good. And I was there that night at the Javits Center and there was a sense of optimism and that she was going to take this all the way home and, and be elected. And, um, and that slowly turned as as we all know as the evening wore on jonathan allen this is this is a seasoned candidate who campaigned before for this position why didn't she catch these things before what's really amazing is mm -hmm. uh the people that she seemed to be struggling the most with in her 2016 campaign were the very people who formed the base of her 2008 campaign which is to say uh working class uh white voters and particularly in the rust belt and in appalachia um, these were the folks that didn't buy what she was saying in 2016 um, you know, I, I think Amy and I, after having talked to uh, dozens and dozens of people who worked on the Clinton campaign, uh, came to the conclusion that what they were telling us was uh, that Hillary Clinton didn't really have a message for uh, the American public that was about what she was going to do for them uh, rather than the campaign. And that's not to say that she didn't have plans for what she was going to do for them. She just wasn't able to articulate them in a way that sounded like it was more about them than about her. Uh, our guest, again, the co-authors of the book Shattered Inside Hillary Clinton's Doomed Campaign, now out in paperback with some new information as our guest reference. If you want to ask them questions about it, it's 202-748-8000 for Democrats, 202-748-8001 for Republicans, Independents, 202 Amy Parnes, let's start then with after the campaign. Where does this defeat leave the Democratic Party? What condition does it find itself now? I think the Democratic Party is still struggling to find um, to find out their identity and who it is, who the party represents. We're still seeing that play out. I cover this every single day for the Hill. Um, there is no party leader. There are people who want uh, President Obama to come back into the picture uh, to play a bigger role. He has been resistant to that. He's been kind of giving advice behind the scenes, but doesn't want to be, um, you know, the, the foremost figure in the Democratic Party. And so I think he's. Um, 
Um, you know, and he also doesn't want to play the foil to uh, President Trump. So he is um, he wants to take a step back um, and kind of let new leadership bubble up. Uh, but that um, remains to be seen. It, it, you know, the, the race for 2020 is anybody's game at this point. Uh, there's no clear winner. I think a lot of people are still trying to figure out, as I said before, what the, the core message of the party is. And I think it's a bigger headline than people realize. I think all of the oxygen right now is obviously around President Trump. But I think the Democratic Party is still struggling, um, particularly on a national level. Um, and that is going to play out uh, in the, the coming uh months and um, years up to 2020. And that's sort of what we talk about in this book a little bit. Jonathan Allen, you hinted at it with this discussion about Tom Perez then. What's his mission then in trying to find this message to appeal to voters? Well, you know, I think, uh, first of all, Tom Perez has been focused uh, a lot on fundraising and has not been doing a particularly good job of that. It's been very difficult for the DNC. I think part of that, obviously, is that the party's out of power. Uh, but you have to look at the rise of super PACs. You have to look at the McCain-Feingold campaign finance law and understand that the role of the National Party Committee is, is just different than it used to be. Um, this is not an organization that has the ability to pick candidates. And in fact, that often backfires. Uh, we've seen that on the Republican side some in the past, but right now the Republican National Committee is uh, doing a lot better in terms of its fundraising, in terms of its coordination. Uh, the DNC is unpopular with its own base. Uh, they're half of the Democratic Party, or roughly half the Democratic Party, felt like the DNC was unfairly tipping the scales in the last uh, presidential election, trying to get uh, Hillary Clinton nominated, trying to hurt Bernie Sanders. So you start with that bad blood. And really, there's just been a clash between these two sides that has resumed. The hostilities that had been put aside at the Democratic Convention in 2016 resumed the minute that Donald Trump was elected. This huge battle for the soul of the Democratic Party between uh, the, the Clinton-type folks and the Sanders folks. And Tom Perez is in the middle of that, and he's gotten very explicit instructions from President Clinton, as we write in the in the paperback extension of the the original book, uh, he's got instructions for Bill Clinton not to let the party go to the Bernie Sanders folks. Uh, and I think people who are reading this, people who are interested in uh, how the Democratic Party is, uh, how it's shattered apart, and how it's trying to put itself back together, um, will find that those uh, passages in here pretty interesting. And I also think. Uh, you know, certainly Republicans will find this interesting as well. Uh, Jonathan Allen also, uh, besides his author work, is the national political reporter for NBC News. Amy Parn serves as the senior political correspondent for The Hill, and we have calls lined up for both of you. Let's start with New Hampshire, Democrats line. Nancy, you are up first for our guest. Good morning. Um, hi there. Um, I'm just curious, during the campaign, I'm in my 60s, so I've been around for a number of elections, and I followed, obviously, Hillary's career, um, Bushes, everybody. But my curiosity is this past campaign with the advent of social media that took over the topics. I mean, nobody asked Hillary Clinton the kind of questions you would normally ask a candidate. They didn't ask her about her foreign policy. They didn't ask her about her jobs plan for the coal miners. They just didn't ask her about policy issues. And a lot of the men who did the interviewing have now been disgraced as men who basically were part of the Me Too. Um, movement because they didn't respect a woman. So not only was social media against Hillary, I mean, Hillary supporters couldn't even call Washington Journal and support her. Um, it's just, I don't understand how her policies never got discussed. Everything was the server Benghazi, the server Benghazi. Two things um, compared to everything Donald Trump has said. The God. media doesn't focus on negativity from his side of it and the horrible things he has said. And even a disabled reporter was mocked. Okay, gotcha, Nancy. Uh, Amy Parnes, you want to start? Well, I, I think that, uh, well, part of it is obviously politics plays a role in this. It's not just about policy. And I think Hillary Clinton uh, felt like if she was the most prepared person, we saw this even going into the debates, and John and I write about this extensively in the book, you know, if she, she felt like if she was, if she came in knowing policy in and out, uh, she could uh, win the debates and, and prove that she is the most uh, capable person, the most experienced person to be in the Oval Office. Uh, but, you know, this, this wasn't 
just about that. It was about a lot of things. And I think one problem that she faced was that she didn't, um, you know, her team did not come out ahead of this email situation. They waited months and months and months until the fall um, of that year to kind of address it and to have her actually issue an apology. So they let the story kind of dominate and faster over several months uh, without even, um, you know, gaining control of the message. And that was a problem. And that was something that John and I report out is that there was a lot of frustration uh, building up inside the campaign. And Bill Clinton was frustrated that they couldn't kind of, you know, get their message across that the email situation was kind of the controversy was dominating the campaign. So I think a lot of this uh, kind of led to uh, to her defeat, you know, and he was just better at he was a little more nimble um, at kind of, you know, playing um, to the media and, you know, calling into shows, something that she eventually um, sought to do also. But I think it was a little too late. Mark in Michigan, Independent Line. Hi. Uh, yeah, Mark. Uh, the concept is I'm, I was disappointed in both the Democrat and Republican. We had Trump take a million dollar tax pay right off for 20 years. I kind of find that fraudulent. We had Hillary. Hillary was going to raise taxes on the rich. There's so many tax write offs that that tax increase ain't going to mean squat anyhow. So, how much of our taxpayer money goes down on the deficit? And does it really matter if how many people are working? They still okay. have that. Okay, you're breaking up, Mark, and I apologize this, but Jonathan Allen, then, to the idea of the message that Hillary Clinton delivered on economics, is there something that to the what the caller was bringing up? Well, it's interesting. The caller was uh, talking about uh, deficits and the debt. Um, there was a huge effort on the Clinton campaign's part to find ways to pay for her programs, something they thought was very important that every time they went out and told the voters about a new program they wanted to do that there was some pay for it, either a cut in spending elsewhere or an increase in taxes. Um, and I think they believed that that was the responsible thing to do and that voters would respond to it. And uh, in the end, it didn't matter at all. What we saw was, uh, you know, President Trump campaign on policies that were clearly uh, going to expand the deficit and then come into office and uh, implement policies, the last tax cut and the, uh, the big spending boost that we just got uh, more recently that exacerbate the deficit. Right now, we're looking at, um, you know, as far as the eye can see, trillion dollar annual deficits and a debt that will skyrocket. Uh, the American voters obviously didn't prioritize that um, as their number one, uh, number one idea going as the election. And by the way, they have not done that for a long time. Uh, you know, the out of power party always complains about deficits and debt. Uh, the in power party al almost always exacerbates them. There are some uh, exceptions to that. George H.W. Bush did a big uh, 1990 budget law that uh, was meant to rein in the deficit. Bill Clinton, uh, some of his budgets were also intended to c cut those down. But largely speaking, over the last you know, 40 years or so, we've seen parties get in power and, and make debt worse. Here is James, Boston, Massachusetts, Democrats line. Hi, good morning to both of you, all three of you. Let's make this real fast and simple. Nobody likes Hillary. It's not her deficit policy, because I don't know what the hell that is. But she, she came up to the wrong people. She came out for white people. Don't get it wrong. White people got it. But her husband came out for us minorities, and she did not. She wanted the white people. She assumed she would get it because she's Democrat. When you come off all snowy, we don't come out and vote. That's her campaign's fault, so she deserved to lose. James, Unfortunately, look where we got replacement. That's James in Massachusetts, Amy Parnes, her appeal to minorities. Uh, well, I think that's she tried to emulate President Obama's strategy in a lot of ways, um, and she felt like if she actually went into cities um, and spoke to minorities, I think that was part of her strategy, actually. And a lot of people were saying, "Well, what about the base? What about the people who voted for your husband? Uh, they are they are the people who will come out and support you." And I think a lot of people felt like she was ignoring those people, the working class uh, people. Uh, and as we saw, she never went back to uh, Wisconsin, a state that, um, you know, obviously supported her before, supported her husband, um, you know, blue collar states like Michigan. She had a problem in the primary. She never really sought to fix that. I, I think she did try, but I don't think it worked out for her. So I think her strategy here uh, was completely amiss. And I think what she was trying to do is fight the last war, as John and I report extensively in the book. Uh, but she didn't really have her own strategy about how to sort of um, call all these people together um, and, and bring the party together, particularly after the primary, uh, the grueling primary, where a lot of Bernie Sanders supporters, a lot of millennials didn't feel the need to come out and support her. Mr. Allen. 
I was just going to say that, you know, before the uh, uh, West Virginia primary in 2008, she basically said, I'm paraphrasing here, but she basically said, we're going to win West Virginia because white people are, are for her campaign. Um, and I'm not sure that everyone forgot that. You know, listen to what the caller just said. In 2016, she targeted uh, her message uh, very much to, to minority voters, particularly in the primary, as a way of winning uh, the delegates that she needed. Uh, by the time she got to the general election, uh, she had alienated some of those white working class voters that had been part of her base in 2008. And I think some of the, the minority voters who remembered what she was talking about in 2008 weren't all that excited uh, about what they were hearing. Um, you know, she had issues with uh, African American turnout in some of the big swing states. Um, and, you know, the, I think President Trump was able to, uh, to win enough of a share of minority voters uh, to obviously to win the Electoral College and win the presidency. Uh, here is John in Michigan for our guest. Hi there. Um, I think the two biggest things that caused Hillary's campaign to fail was when she was actually honest a couple times and called half of Trump's voters deplorable. And she said she was going to put the coal miners out of business and laughed about it. She destroyed herself by doing those two things. And then you have Tom Perez right now at the DNC who came out and actually said that you cannot be pro-life and be a Democrat. And you have Dick Durbin confirming what Perez said. The DNC and the Democratic Party have a major problem, and they've got to start communicating better with people and quit telling the truth. That's my comment. I'll let both of you uh, run with that, Mr. Allen. It's not often uh, a party is advised to quit telling the truth. Um, but uh, I, you know, I think the caller makes a makes a good point that uh, Hillary Clinton appeared to let give a, give us a window into her thinking in those episodes. Uh, the truth is, um, you know, we're we're not probably as a society going to start opening up a whole lot more coal mines over the next, you know, five, ten, fifteen years. Um, I think it's more about the way she said it. I think it's more about uh, about an impression that she was insensitive about it, though. The argument she was making was, because we're not going to be able to bring back all these coal jobs, here's how we're going to transition workers in these areas into new, into new economies. Um, I actually have heard many other Democrats make that same argument and not get the blowback. Um, so, I, you know, it's hard, to, it's hard to explain. It may be particular to her, it may be a gender thing. But I've heard a lot of Democrats say pretty much the same thing, not get the blowback. As far as the deplorables go, I don't think it's beneficial to any presidential candidate ever um, to, to slam any segment of the American public. It, you know, it just, it, it doesn't come off well, either to the voters they're targeting or often to the voters they're not targeting. Ms. Parnes. Mm -hmm. And she, you know, had made these comments before, either behind the scenes and whatever, and I don't think they sensed a problem, but it, it was interesting, as John and I reported in the book, that, you know, as soon as this happened, they uh, felt the need, her campaign felt the need to, they knew that it was a problem and, and put out a, you know, a statement kind of walking it back. Um, and I think they felt good about that, but um, but that weekend led to um, you know it was a it was a painful weekend for her. It was the 9/11 weekend. Um, people saw her fall, take a fall. That video played on loop for a while with no explanation from her campaign as to what happened, um, why she was sick. There was a rumor that you know she was fighting an illness. Um, so I think all of this sort of led to you know what else are they hiding? What's what's going on behind the scenes in the campaign? And I think there was a lot. Of frustration kind of building up there. So I think it was a culmination of all these things. Um, a, a lot of um, trust obviously played into this, um, but, but it definitely led, I think, to uh, Donald Trump's victory. Uh, this is Larry, Pompano Beach, Florida, Republican line. Yes. Uh, you know, one thing, I wrote some things down here. Uh, I think one thing, you know, ironically, the internet age that the Democrats used to always tout as being to their advantage kind of worked to their detriment here. <laughs> Uh, the, the Dems need to move more to the center. And uh, the second point I wanted to make, you know, I think the Democrats need to seriously address character, ethic, morality issues within their own political elite. Uh, don't worry about whether Demo uh, Republicans do something or not. But, you know, again, it's kind of we're in the age where the, the rats are shown because of the light. Uh, and the other point is that I think the Democratic Party needs to support infrastructure on a bipartisan basis. Right now, the Democrats are so hell-bent on 
trashing Trump that they uh, that they're losing themselves. In other words, you've got to get on, you know, with your own programs and, and offer something supportive to the American people uh, and move more to the center. And I'll tell you what, the the radical uh, left they got to, uh, the Democrats got to quit patronizing them, tell them move to our center. And I think as a whole, the Democratic Party would do a lot better if they moved to the center and they could actually, you know, win some house uh, seats in the House and the Senate. Got, gotcha, gotcha, Larry. Uh, Amy Parnes, one of the things we saw come out after the campaign was something called a Unity Reform Commission. What is it? How does that apply to the, the Democratic Party as it stands today? Well, I think, first of all, the caller is right, and we're hearing this uh, from a lot of people. I think there is a divide in very much in the party about which direction it goes. There are a lot of people, you know, the Bernie Sanders faction, the Elizabeth Warren faction, who that want to take it more to the left. And then there are people like Vice President Biden, who, um, you know, is a potential candidate possibly for 2020. And, and he's essentially saying, look, Barack Obama and I won on, you know, based on bringing everyone together. You know, we don't, our party doesn't need to tackle left or go center. We need to kind of appeal to all of this. And I think he's right also, the caller's right in that, uh, you know, the party can't just be anti-Trump. It needs to provide a message for, uh, you know, what it needs to lure people into the polls and, and give people a reason why they're voting. I think that was uh, one of the reasons why the Obama campaign was so successful, because it kind of had this optimistic, optimistic message, um, you know, hope and change, and it brought people out and people it gave people some an aspiration reason to believe. Um, and that's something that the Clinton campaign kind of lacked. And I think a lot of people are looking kind of toward, uh, you know, a future figure who can kind of do that, who can kind of be the modern version of the Democratic Party and kind of bring back what the Democratic Party means. Um, you know, you know the, the old, kind of the old fashioned version of what being a Democrat means. Um, and I think the party has kind of gotten away from that. And so a lot of people are trying to bring it back. Mr. Allen. Um, you'd asked about the Unity Reform Commission. Uh, it may not be so aptly named because there does not always seem to be unity on this uh, commission that's basically been designed to uh, to rewrite or at least re-examine the Democratic rules, uh, their nominating rules, et cetera. Uh, they've been fighting. There's been a huge war that's gone on between the Sanders people and the Clinton people and actually some frustration among the Clinton people at the chair of that commission uh, because she didn't do exactly what all the Clinton people wanted to do every single time. Um, it is a party that's sort of in search of uh, a leader and in search of a direction at the moment. Um, you know, they will uh, certainly benefit from, uh, in the midterm elections, to some degree, anti-Trump uh, sentiment within the party being a unifying force. But they haven't really figured out what that next step is for them. And, and interestingly, I mean, you had Hillary Clinton, who, uh, you know, was trying to be the next uh, Barack Obama term a little bit and trying to be the next Bill Clinton term a little bit and trying to bring the pull those threads together and whether it was uh, specific to her or whether that's just too difficult to do uh, she was unable to get it done um, at least in a way that uh, that resulted in her being president so you know I think the next leader as Amy was saying um, you know there is this big battle uh, between the left push left or push center uh, and a lot of people are saying you got to be able to do both I'm not sure anybody's figured out what that magic bullet is to be able to do both. Uh, Democrats line from Pennsylvania. John, good morning. Good morning. Uh, I was a uh, Bernie uh, Sanders supporter, but I voted for Hillary in the end. And uh, my question is, uh, where was uh, Paul Begala and James Carville? They were the ones that wanted for a bill. And I just wonder why she never, she didn't use uh, those people. And also, we've got to get rid of the Electoral College. Uh, we're, we're ending up with uh, the second best in both the elections we had with uh, those winners. So that's my question, and I'd like, I'll hang up and listen. Mr. Allen. I mean, the, uh, the short answer on the Electoral College is that it's, uh, that it's very difficult to do that. Uh, basically, you'd have to rewrite the Constitution to get that done. Uh, so two-thirds uh, of each chamber of Cong Congress and then uh, three-quarters of the states or a constitutional convention. These are things that are very just logistically very difficult to do. Um, you know, in terms of Carville and Begala, uh, they are both uh, people who are still in contact with uh, President Clinton, certainly uh, have the ability to communicate with Hillary Clinton. Paul Begala was heavily involved with Priorities, Priorities USA, which is the uh, the big Democratic super PAC. Um, so, you know, they're people that are part of the part of the game, but they were not the quarterback. Uh, Amy Parnes, then, who was the and one? I think a lot of the... Go ahead. 
Sorry, I, I just want to add, I think a lot of the reason was that Hillary Clinton wanted this to be her campaign, not his campaign. Um, and there was a very big sense of kind of um, drawing a red line and um, separating his side from her side. And, and you saw him kind of, the former president, stay home for a while. Uh, you know, he was playing a behind the scenes role, but you didn't really see him come out and um, campaign for her until right before the Iowa caucus. Um, and that was a strategy that, you know, was designed to kind of let her uh, run the show. They had learned some lessons uh, from that in 2008. And Amy Parnes, then who was the one that Hillary Clinton would always listen to for better or for worse? <laughs> I, well, that's a complicated question because I think she was listening to a lot of people, and that's part of the reason why there wasn't, uh, you know, a, a core um, a core message. I think she, you know, had the, the thing about Hillary Clinton is that she has all these people around her, uh, people from her time as, sen as senator, uh, from her time at the White House as first lady, as secretary of state, and all these people are kind of talking to her ear, and then she has her husband and his whole wing of people. So I think that it was really hard. And, and as John and I report in the book, you know, the two top people on the campaign, John Podesta and Robbie Mook, didn't always get along. Um, she stopped talking to her campaign manager at one point. There was a lot of kind of distrust happening. So, uh, you know, this is all uh, freshly reported in our book. And, and so I think there was um, a huge problem uh, there in terms of who she listens to and, you know, what the pecking order was um, and, and all the f internal factions fighting. This kind of all led to her loss. Uh -huh. Go ahead. To, I was just going to say to Amy's point, I mean, this book is essentially the, the playbook on how to blow a presidential campaign. Um, and it, uh, to Amy's point, there was a ton of infighting, um, you know, which isn't helpful. Uh, but at the end of the day, it comes back to the candidate and who, how that candidate is making decisions uh, and what are the things informing those decisions and who are the people informing those decisions. Uh, and ultimately, this is a candidate that should have had every advantage in the world, um, you know, in terms of uh, she had money, she had the pick of strategists at the, at the beginning, both to get through the Democratic primary and to get through the general election. Uh, she was coming off President Obama's uh, presidency. He, the economy was, if not doing gangbusters, it was certainly doing uh, reasonably well, and, and her predecessor was popular. She was the uh, wife of a former president who uh, even people who don't like him sort of give him credit as a campaigner. And all of these things came, and she, by the way, had run for president before. She knew what she was doing, uh, or, or should have known what she was doing, um, and, you know, still ended up uh, kind of kicking away a huge lead in the polls and, and ultimately losing to Donald Trump by the narrowest of margins. In a, a little over a minute, I want to ask both of you, what compelled you to make the addendum to the book? What kind of information led you to do that? I mean, the honest answer is that the publisher wanted us to do more for the paperback. <laughs> uh, but uh, we continue, but but also we continue to report. I mean, we, you know, we talk to people after the, the, the book comes out originally, people call you and tell you what they think. Or they call you and tell you about things that they knew that didn't end up in the book, and so we thought, hey, there's a bunch, there's enough more, more material here that it really makes uh, sense to do it. There are uh, new episodes reported in here, and also, I, you know, sort of an interesting angle going into next year. Some of the Democratic candidates may be mayors. Uh, we got a lot about the mayors and why they might be uh, candidates in 2020. Ms. Parnes. Oh, well, I, I definitely agree with John. I, I think that there are a lot of questions, you know, as to why she lost and, and how we ended up with Donald Trump that still play out today. I think we tried to do that. We tried to dissect that as best as possible in the book. And this new chapter kind of provides more insight. You know, a lot of people are saying, well, Russia played a role. Uh, Comey played a role. But the point of the book is that she had, as John said earlier, she had every advantage going into this race. You know, this was hers to lose. Mm -hmm. And yet she still ended up losing. Um, and, and she should have ended up really um, doing a lot of damage and winning in a very big way. And so I think that uh, this is sort of what we tried, the, the, mm -hmm. what we tried to lay out in this book. And this new chapter kind of backs up that and shows more evidence about what went wrong during her campaign and how her campaign, um, you know, gotcha. didn't do her. Uh, or, yeah. Uh, so we're talking with the book authors of the book Shattered inside Hillary Clinton's Doom campaign, Jonathan Allen and Amy Parnes. We'll take a break for a brief pro forma session of the House. The House will be in order. The chair lays before the House a communication from the Speaker. 
The Speaker's Rooms, Washington, D.C., May 1, 2018. I hereby appoint the Honorable Alexander X. Mooney to act as Speaker Pro Tempore on this day. Signed, Paul D. Ryan, Speaker of the House of Representatives. The prayer will be offered by the guest chaplain, Reverend Dr. Dan C. Cummins, People's Church, Jacksonville, Texas. Come pray with me. Lord, make us instruments of your peace. Where there is hatred, let us sow love. Where there is injury, let us grant pardon. Where there is doubt, let us build faith. Where there is despair, let us restore one's hope. Father, make us vessels of your joy. Let the sowers of thy grace remain in the field, lest nefarious winds scatter hate and despair. Jesus, make us bearers of your light to dispel any darkness, so our house is kept swept, lest our joy become lost. Let this house become as thine, a house of prayer. O Divine Master, grant that we may not so much seek as to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive. It is in pardoning that you pardon us. For it was in dying that you gave us eternal life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Pursuant to Section 3A of House Resolution 839, the Journal of the Last Day's Proceedings is approved. The Chair will lead the House in the Pledge of Allegiance. <clears throat> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. The chair lays before the House a communication. The Honorable the Speaker, House of Representatives, sir, I hereby tender my resignation from my office in the United States House of Representatives, effective at midnight Friday, April 27, 2018. It has been an honor and a privilege to serve the people of the 7th District of Pennsylvania. God bless the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania and the United States of America. Signed sincerely, Patrick L. Meehan. Under clause, 5D of Rule 20, the Chair announces to the House that, in light of the resignation of the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Meehan, the whole number of the House is 428. Seven. Pursuant to Section 3B of House Resolution 839, the House stands adjourned until 9.30 a.m. on Thursday, May 3rd of 2018. There's the former proceedings of the House of Representatives. Back to calls for our guests, Amy Parnes and Jonathan Allen, co-authors of the book Shattered, inside Hillary Clinton's doom campaign, 202-748-8000 for Democrats, 202-748-8001 for Republicans, Independents, 202-748-8002. Reading, California, Democrats line. Susan, good morning. Hi, good morning. Thank you for taking my call. I have a comment about the, uh, Hillary and the campaign of the Democratic Party. Um, I was just wondering if the problem just wasn't Hillary's personality, because in the, the Democrats trying to go on, you know, past um, successes, but, I mean, uh, Paul was talking about um, Carville, and, and I voted for um, Hillary, but I originally voted for Bernie because of his personality. He, he didn't get flustered by Trump. And I seem like Hillary did. And she didn't have much of a, she seemed like she didn't have much of a sense of humor at all. And if anybody needed humor against Trump, Hillary needed, or whoever needed, uh, you know, humor and, and, a, and a fight. 
and she seemed to be got flustered with Trump, and it you know took the scale. I think that is what caused the, the whole campaign to tip the scales. I and mean, you need somebody tough, like you know uh, Bernie, that just didn't get flustered by Trump or anybody else, and just kept going and kept sticking to the the subject. Gotcha, Susan. And, Thank you, Mr. Allen. I've been trying to. Uh I've been trying myself to um, affect that perfect tough and funny bit my whole life. <laughs> it's a difficult tightrope to walk that the caller would like. Um, I, you know, I think it's impossible to empirically measure personality as a factor in elections, but I think we all know um, that that is a huge factor in elections. Uh, it, there is a question of who, do, who does the voter um, feel is going to have their interest in mind. Who does the voter feel is like them? Who does the voter feel uh, they do like? Um, and, you know, it's interesting. Uh, there were a lot of voters, I think, who voted against President Trump because of his personality more than uh, any particular policy, and some because of his policy, but also a lot who seemed to enjoy the show. Um, and that was a, a charisma thing. That was a personality thing. Look, the guy was a successful television star. Uh, he's um, obviously able to command our attention in a way that uh, few have been, been able to before. And Hillary Clinton's much drier, a policy wonk. I think she believed that was her strength. I think it is her strength, uh, somebody who really uh, thinks about issues and gets into the weeds of them. Uh, her ability to make that jump from policy want to explaining the policy, uh, I think, was was limited. Um, she does not have that big mass charisma of a Barack Obama, George H. W. I mean, sorry, George W. Bush, a Bill Clinton, or or Donald Trump. Amy Parnes, is the Hillary Clinton we see in front of the cameras during the campaign different from the Hillary Clinton that we see off the camera? Uh, well, if you talk to her aides, a lot of them will say yes. Uh, and that's something, you know, John and I have written two books now about her. Uh, and a lot of people throughout both books, when we sat down and interviewed with them, they said, look, she's a completely different person behind the scenes. She's funny and gregarious and everyone loves her. And she's the first to, you know, if there's a sick relative, call that relative um, or send a note. Um, but I, I think she has been reluctant her whole life to kind of make that um, impression publicly. She likes to live her very public life privately. Uh, and that's a problem for her. I think, um, you know, there there were tweaks in the campaign made, particularly uh, in the fall of 2015, where, um, you know, her staff wanted her to come out uh, and they wanted to roll out funny Hillary Clinton. And they kind of telegraphed that. And the New York Times wrote a story about, you know, how here comes funny Hillary Clinton and she's, you know, warm hearted. And, and, and I think a lot of people were, were kind of put off by that, you know, that a, a lot of people around her actually said, why, why would you need to telegraph that? Why does it seem so contrived? Um, and so I think that was a really big problem for her. And, and when you talk to aides and when John and I did, they called that an unforced error because it should have come a little more organically without uh, that b big push around her personality. I was just going to say, um, you know, the part of the issue for Clinton, if you have watched her over time and you talk to people close to her, and, uh, is that her humor um, that the people she pays say that, you know, is, is abundant. Um, and you always have to watch out for when the people you pay say you're funny. Um, but, uh, but her humor is often biting and sarcastic um, and witty and, and smart and fast. Um, but that doesn't necessarily translate particularly well in a political campaign. Um, sarcasm doesn't work well on television for whatever reason. Very few people are able to uh, get laughs with sarcasm. So, um, you know, I think it might be a mismatch where here's somebody who has the capacity to be funny but not necessarily in the way that uh, appeals to voters on, you know, through, through television, which is mo mainly how presidential candidates meet voters. Democrats line, Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Perry, hi there. Hi, please forgive me. I'm just getting over mouth surgery. So, um, but two things. First, Hillary had no business running for president if she's under investigation for emails, under investigation for anything you don't run. But you know what, considering all, her losing was the best thing that could happen. We actually needed a Republican to win so that we could actually bring out what the Republicans are doing in the House and Senate. Having Trump was the best option because he got he let the Congress do whatever they wanted. He let his idea of, of Congress in the House getting done, what does he do? He, he calls up Brian, he calls up McConnell and says, get her done. I mean, that's, that's no way to run the government. But you know what? By, 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 letting the, by letting the Republicans rule and how they did it with health care 
and what they did with uh, with the tax with the tax cuts, it's working out much better for the Democrats because of because of him getting elected. We had protests and protests again. People getting out and, and marching, and people getting out and signing up to vote, and realizing the mistakes that they've made by not voting in the last couple of uh, midterms. Gotcha, Perry. Thanks, Mr. Allen. You start. Well, uh, first of all, I hope Perry uh, recovers from his mouth surgery uh, as uh, you know as quickly and, and fully as possible. Um, yeah, I, <laughs> uh, I'm not sure that uh, that any party uh, is really served best in the short term or the long term by allowing the other party to have power uh, and get the things that they want to done. Um, you know, but, uh, but it's an interesting idea. Um, I think we're going to see some backlash in the midterms. Uh, it looks like Democrats are going to pick up seats in the House, if not take control of the House. Uh, the Senate's a little tougher to figure out, but it seems likely that there will be fewer Republicans in Washington come January uh, as a result and part of a, a public backlash against the president. We see this in most midterm elections, uh, so it's not not unique to President Trump. Amy Parnes. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, as John said, in, in 2010, President Obama talked about a shellacking that his party received. Um, I, I think that that's coming, I think, for Republicans. Um, but yeah, I do agree with the caller in that. Um, I think that what, what this did was it kind of unified a lot of people and got people uh, motivated to uh, to actually, you know, turn out against uh, President Trump. But, but as we talked about earlier, I think there needs to be a lot more happening within the party to kind of lure people together, to get people out to the polls, give people a reason uh, to vote again. Uh, and, and that, I don't think, has, has uh, that remains to be seen right now about how the party actually accomplishes that. I think uh, that continues to be a problem for, for the party. It's a little harder to get on a hat, give people a reason to vote again, but it uh, sounds a little bit like uh, the Democratic <laughs> version of MAGA. Uh, so the book is shattered inside Hillary Clinton's doom campaign. The co-authors joining us this morning, Jonathan Allen here in New York, Amy Parnes in New York. New York. Phoenix, Arizona, Independent Line. This is Reince. Hello. Hey, good morning to all. Um, just a couple things. First of all, I voted for Obama in 08. Um, but I think Hillary lost me on a few levels. Um, one reason was is uh, you know, I was a working class guy working for the railroad, and she was going after the coal miners, and so I had to think about my job. But on the same token, she was wanting to bring in um, you know the refugees and the immigrants. There's nothing racist about it. It just didn't make any sense to me that you know I didn't need, I needed to go get new skills. And, uh, you know, the, on the other hand, our tax dollars are going to pay for uh, immigrants and refugees, which I think overpopulation is going to be an issue in the future anyway. Um, and on that note, I'd also say I think the left has went way too far left. I was a Clinton supporter. I would, like I said, I voted for Obama in 08. And uh, I think Trump's a little wild, a little loony, but he's doing a decent job. And, and if the you know, Democrats don't change their ways, he's going to get another four years. Thanks, guys. Love to see We've talked about Democrats, uh, the, the influence on the Democratic Party. Give us your sense then of the Republican Party now that President Trump has been in, in office for well over a year. Where does it stand, at least in your opinion? Amy Parnes, you start. Uh, I, I think the Republican Party is also kind of in trouble. Uh, there, there is a division there as well. A lot of people are anti-Trump within the party. A lot of people uh, are, are really frustrated with what he's done to the party. Um, and, and there's still that turmoil kind of building. And, you know, whether or not he gets a challenger in 2020 still remains. There's someone like John Kasich who could run against him. Uh, a lot of people, I think, a lot of Republicans want to see a challenger. So uh, I, I think that all kind of remains. It's going to play out uh, in a big way, I think. And uh, But, yeah. I think both parties right now are kind of searching for for their identity. Uh, you know, the, the Democrats are trying to decide. You know, do we go to do, did we go too far left in 2016? Do we continue to, to tack that way? The Republicans are saying, you know, was this too extreme? Was Donald Trump an extreme pick for us? And what is he doing? You know, conservatives in particular, what is he doing to our party? So I think both of the parties right now are doing a little bit of um, soul searching. Mr. Allen, we write a little bit about these dynamics in the in the book, Pedro. I, you know, the the Republican Party and the Democratic Party are, um, in some ways, in, in similar position, uh, a few years apart. Uh, the Democratic Party became the Obama Party, and this has always been true 
uh, you know, president takes over, wins the presidency, and, and the party sort of subsumes into that, that person. Uh, but I think to a greater degree than we've seen in the past, that was true of the Democrats in, uh, after the 2008 election of President Obama, who then started his own organization, Organizing for America, um, that was supposed to be, you know, sort of outside of the, the DNC structure. The Republicans are now the Trump party. I mean, the, the, there is a Republican National Committee. It raises money. But ultimately, the tone, the message, the policy, Everything is set by President Trump, and anybody who walks off the line of the Trump Republican Party is considered an apostate to Republicanism. Um, and I think that that's going to continue to be the case for as long as President Trump is there. Uh, the rise of uh, outside money and uh, public frustration with the parties and the party system in Washington uh, means that you know, we are moving more and more in that direction where voters are looking for somebody who is outside the party, somebody who is not a creature of the party. Uh, not as true of Obama as it was of Trump, but very true of Bernie Sanders, who almost pulled off the Democratic primary upset, um, you know, despite going up against uh, a legacy of, of the Clinton family. In writing about those dynamics, our guests, right, as they began to look at the growing field of potential candidates in 2017, Democrats were certain they need to find an antidote to Trump to take advantage of the natural swing of the political pendulum. What is less clear is what which equal and opposite reaction voters would be looking for in 2020. Democrats were in search of a candidate, a set of policies, and a message that could defeat the hated Trump. The party lacked consensus on who could deliver all of that, but there is no shortage of untested hopefuls who believe they could. Amy Parnes, you've kind of hinted at some of those people sifting around as who could be that person. Uh, who are we missing? Are there any dark horses, at least, that could be considered at this point? Well, I think a lot of people are interested in someone like Mitch Landrieu, for instance, uh, the mayor of New Orleans. And John talked earlier about how a new crop of um, people are coming up, particularly a lot of people are looking at mayors uh, going forward. Uh, and they're saying, you know, why not give someone a fresh try, you know, a fresh face, a, a, a try at this. So I think someone like, like Landrieu, um, people are also looking at, uh, you know, a newbie like Kamala Harris, a newbie to Washington. Uh, and so, you know, they're thinking, why not? why not give her a chance uh, and uh, I think a lot of donors are excited about the prospects of that happening so th there are people who are you know kind of uh, at the they are dark horses and I think it'll be interesting to see if Democrats kind of want someone like that or if they want someone like Joe Biden or someone who's been tested and has been around uh, and and that will be interesting to see uh, in uh, you know the direction of the party Mr. Allen um, you know, I, I think we're going to have to wait to watch some of this. Uh, Amy mentions Kamala Harris, Cory Booker, the New Jersey Senator, Elizabeth Warren, Bernie Sanders. I mean, you can, it, there is a never-ending list of people who might be running for president. Eric Holder. Every time I pick up the newspaper, there's a new Democrat running for president. So uh, if there are, you know, uh, you know, half the country's uh, Democrats, you know, uh, voting age population, maybe like 100 million Democrats or something in the country, or 50 million, if you, or 65 million voted for Hillary Clinton. Uh, all of them seem to be running for president, all 65 million. Um, I don't think we're going to know for a while what the energy is in the Democratic Party, where it wants to go. I think Bernie Sanders and his, uh, his group are going to be a force uh, because he has uh, built his operation and continued to maintain it and continue to be politically active. I think a lot of Democrats in Washington don't want to think about that and they don't talk about it a lot. But whether or not Bernie Sanders is the next Democratic nominee, he and his supporters are going to be a force in that uh, process. The other thing I would just uh, just sort of mention here is, you know, the Republicans had, I think it was 17 candidates in the last election, and they had a slugfest, a brutal war, and Donald Trump emerged. Um, you know, not to make it sound too much like a reality TV show, but uh, basically he was the survivor. And not just the survivor, I mean, he really kind of knocked everybody else out. I think there's a very good chance you're going to see the same kind of dynamics on the Democratic side, uh, where the person who is able to defeat everyone else is seen as the strongest uh, to take on Trump by virtue of the fact that they survived that. I think the days of political parties anointing uh, somebody as their next presidential candidate are over. Uh, from Cincinnati, Ohio, Republican line. Mary, you're on with our guest. Go ahead. Thank you. Yes, uh, the one word we got to understand is respect. We do have it. The men give it to the women. We just got to teach this right. Uh, what it is is self-esteem, doing daily uh, deeds for integral ways to maintain this planet. Now, another word we've got to understand and get rid of is campaign. What do you want to hurt for? 
Why do you have to have a sick realm? Pain is sick. We don't need that. We need to understand and change the word to plan. Okay, let's go to Wanda in Michigan, Democrats line. Hi, Wanda, go ahead. Hi, good morning. Thanks for taking my call. I just think what happened with Hillary's uh, campaign and, and her losing had a lot to do with how the Democrats tried to smear Bernie Sanders. I have adult young children who are adults now, and they're voting. And they were so upset with the Democratic Party and how they did Bernie Sanders. And they were, I don't even know if they can, the Democrats can get the trust of the younger people back again unless they do something a whole lot different and try not to smear somebody like Bernie Sanders. Bernie Sanders is still very popular with the younger people. And I think that he's going to have a real shot at it if the DNC is honest and doesn't try to smear him. So that's really all I got to say. I think that that was a big mistake that the DNC did. They did it behind closed doors. I know they changed the head of the DNC, but there should have been some punishments put out for that woman that did that. And to both of you, you can talk about that and also talk about where Bernie Sanders, his feeling, I guess, or you know how they feel towards each other this day, the DNC and Bernie Sanders. Mr. Allen, you start. There's no love lost, Pedro. <laughs> I mean, look, the, the, uh, you know, as we write in the uh, paperback extension of the book uh, out today, um, there, there's been a fight over who gets to control the dead carcass of the DNC. Uh, you know, the Sanders people want the machinery. They don't want to get, uh, you know, for lack of a better term, well, I'll find a better term. They, <laughs> they, they don't want to get, uh, they don't want to get screwed by, um, by party machinery again, so they want to have control of that. They want to have control of the rules. The Clinton folks do not want to give that up. I, arguably, have spent more time uh, the Clinton folks wrestling for control of the DNC than they have fighting Donald Trump since the campaign. Certainly, on a public level, you've seen much more energy into that, uh, you know, internal stuff. And of course, you know, Hillary Clinton has to fight the fact that there's so many people that go out there and say she should have no role, she's not somebody who should speak publicly, um, you know, all of which is ridiculous. There are plenty of things on which she can, um, you know, she can weigh in that are not necessarily politically explosive or hurt her party. But uh, I think the, um, you know, that focus of the Clintons on the Democratic National Committee uh, just shows um, how much animosity there still is between those two sides. Ms. Parnes? Well, I, one thing, one of the most fascinating pieces, I think, in 2016 was that millennial women didn't show up to support Secretary Clinton uh, on, on Election Day. And I found that fascinating. And, you know, throughout, these are a lot of people, there, there were people who supported uh, Bernie Sanders uh, who didn't feel the need. They felt like Hillary Clinton had done him wrong, uh, that the party had done him wrong, and they weren't willing to come out and support her. And I think the party is going to have to really work hard uh, to win back some of these people and and you know and as john said earlier i think it's going to be less about someone who's anointed um, someone who is the inevitable candidate and more about um, someone who the people are kind of wanting and rallying behind but yeah i, I do think that the party is going to have to to work to to uh, get those porter, those supporters out to the polls randall is in arizona independent line hi go ahead hi good morning and good morning america and all the c-span listeners I appreciate the post-mortem on, on what everybody's talking about. However, I haven't heard one solution, and here's the one solution I want to propose. Next election, as in every election, we can resolve a myriad of complexities by simply going to the voting booth, and if it says incumbent under a person's name, you, no matter if it's Joe Blow from Kokomo, we vote for non-incumbents. We, the people, have the power of the vote, yet we haven't exercised it simply because we got to go to the usual suspects. Just like in Minnesota, when Jesse Ventura became governor, we've never heard anything from Roger Moe or Skip Humphrey. And I would tell people, there's a solution to every problem. And instead of thinking how it has been, think outside the box and go back to what our founding fathers said. We, the people. All right. Okay. Uh, so... Let me take that to both of you then. Do you think the age of the outsider candidate is still with us, especially in future elections, considering what we learned from the last election? Well, uh, you know, to the point we're making the book, it's hard to know what the next pendulum swing will be. Uh, but the, I would say the strong suggestion of not just very recent history, but beyond that, is that you always have to be an outsider candidate. If you think about it, uh, Jimmy Carter 
ran as an outside ca outsider candidate. Ronald Reagan as an outsider candidate. George H.W. Bush was unable to do that, did not do that, won the presidency despite it. Bill Clinton ran as an outsider candidate, the man from hope. Uh, you know, George W. Bush, despite being the son of a president, ran as an outsider candidate, the governor from Texas, somebody who had eschewed all the you know, Washington niceties, which of course he hadn't, but he ran that way. Uh, Barack Obama as the outsider candidate, the state legislator who you know, was you know, on the, the steps of the Capitol in Springfield, uh, coming from the outside campaign based in Chicago. Donald Trump, the outsider candidate, despite of course being inside. All of these people are insiders more or less, and run as outsiders, and it is integral to them winning. Um, you know, Clinton didn't, Hillary Clinton did not try to do that. Uh, it's arguable was whether it would be seen as uh, too cute by half had she done it, or uh, perhaps would have allowed her, uh, you know, in some way to, to muddy that picture with Trump. But yeah, I think Americans always think that it's better to have some Washington outsider to come clean up Washington even though they're really not. I mean, Donald Trump was a political outsider in terms of not being elected. He was not a political outsider in terms of being somebody who, um, you know, had none of the trappings of power and wealth and political influence. Amy Parnes. But I think that's, you know, why people gravitated towards someone like Bernie Sanders, because even though he was in Washington and had, uh, you know, all this experience, he kind of uh, brought issues to the people like uh, he wanted free college and he wa he spoke to um, issues that the people wanted. So I think and in many ways, I think Secretary Clinton was trying to do that as well. And, and it was so hard for her, obviously, to portray herself as, you know, someone who could who could do that, who could be the outsider. Uh, but you yeah, I, I think that that's why uh, S Senator Sanders was successful because he was able, you know, his campaign kind of was a very grass, a, a grassroots sort of campaign. It got people involved. It got people to donate small amounts, much like Barack Obama. Um, so I think the, the key here is that people need to feel like they're involved. They need to feel like there was, that there's some um, momentum and a reason for them to support this person. And that was something I think that Secretary Clinton had kind of coming into the campaign that people forget about. There was this group called Ready for Hillary that was kind of building up that enthusiasm for people. Uh, and, uh, you know, it somehow or another, it didn't quite, quite work out. The campaign didn't really believe in that organization and it got kind of thrown out the window. But I think, you know, it, I think a winning campaign kind of needs that support behind it. Uh, from our Republican line in Tennessee, John is next. Uh, yes, I'm one of them deplorables. And uh, I would like each of your guests to come down to Tennessee. Like, what did they hear Trump the other day when he said they came out of the foothills and everywhere else in the state? So find out why we voted for Trump, if you can. Now, about Hillary, when you start calling people names and uh, figure out what she stands for, murdering babies, homosexuals, changing marriage to homosexuals, and then you hang up on me because you can't take the truth. And this show should be checked out by Donald Trump, and if this is uh, funded by the government, they need to cut half the money off, or they need to get true conservatives. Well, John, well, it. let me stop you there. A, we're not funded by the government. B, you said what you said, and we're allowed to say it without being cut off. We'll leave it at that. To the future of uh, then Hillary Clinton, then, where do you see her role in future campaigns, either as I don't know if as a candidate, but at least an advisor or an influence, uh, Mr. Allen. As we report in the book, she said on election night she was never going to be a candidate again. And uh, uh, I think that's something you can believe her on. Um, I think that, uh, you know, history is going to judge her in, um, I think, in a much better way than she's judged in the moment in that uh, there's going to be um, a two-dimensionalization of Hillary Clinton, which is true of all historical figures, right? Over time, we're going to forget about the, the little things within the, the, the campaign itself or within the campaigns. And ultimately, she's going to be seen as somebody who um, blazed a lot of trails. And when, some, when a woman is elected president of the United States, whether it's a Democrat or Republican, that woman's going to stand on Hillary Clinton's shoulders. Um, this is somebody who is... Uh, figure in our politics over the last quarter of a century and will continue to be. Um, so, you know, I think she's very worried about what her legacy is going to be, uh, and she is somebody who is trying to figure out how to participate in politics now in a way that makes that better, uh, not worse. And at the end of the day, 
I don't think anything she does right now is going to have a real big impact on that. 50 years from now, kids are going to be reading about her in textbooks, and it's going to be the first lady who ran for president twice, won the nomination the first time, uh, and was a tremendously polarizing figure. And maybe historians 50 years from now will have a, a little bit of a better answer as to why all those things were. Amy Parnes. Well, I, I do think that there is a little bit of turmoil going on about how she plays a role uh, going forward in the party. There are a lot of people that I've spoken to um, in stories that I've reported recently in The Hill that say, you know, she should kind of follow what uh, President Obama did and, and the fact that he kind of comes in when he feels the need to weigh in on messages, um, on important issues, uh, and then kind of take a, a back seat, um, you know, for, for the rest of it. And I think a lot of people think that that's appropriate for her. I think she's she's not quite willing to do that yet. She's kind of fighting for it. Uh, she wants to play a more, a, a bigger role. You've heard her kind of talk about that recently and saying, uh, you know, they wouldn't say that uh, to a man. Uh, and so I think there there is, she is trying to kind of uh, walk a fine line right now and figure out what that delicate balance is. She does have a lot of supporters. I think John's right. She, she will go down in the history books as, uh, you know, one of the most important uh, female uh, political figures in our history. So I think, yeah, I, it, it is a tricky balance, though, and I think she's trying to figure out what that is right now. And, and the, the organization, the Cl Clinton organization, has changed a lot since she lost. You know, there's no uh, structure and no strategy and a lot of freewheeling mm -hmm. going on. So I think they're all trying to figure out how, you know, the way forward and, and whether or not another Clinton runs even, if, if we'll see Chelsea Clinton in the future, maybe. Uh, the newly expanded book is called <laughs> Shattered. Inside Hillary Clinton's Doom Campaign, two guests joining us, Jonathan Allen and Amy Parnes. And to both of you, thanks for joining us this morning. Thanks, Pedro, and happy release thanks, day, Pedro. Amy.